I'm Eric Newton, and this is The Together Show. We all know relationships take work, but what is that work, and how do we do it? As a former divorce lawyer, I've watched thousands of couples break up firsthand. Having seen the worst in relationships, I decided to try to help couples stay together. So on this show, we talk to real couples and find out what love really looks like. In a, in a weird way, not that I want him to not continue doing as well, but I would want to do well so I could actually somehow create some sense of balance because I feel like since we've been together, he's always helped me. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for listening. We've been getting a lot more email from listeners lately. Some of the email is asking for advice. Some has suggestions for us or just positive feedback. Thank you. And we're planning a show to answer the advice email soon, so stay tuned for that. And today I thought I'd respond to one of the suggestion emails, and here it is. A listener named Jacob writes, I fucking love your podcast. You guys are doing great work. One piece that's driving me bonkers about it, though, is the spoken volume levels are so uneven sometimes. I don't know how you would fix this, but I'd love to be able to set my volume in one place and know I'm going to hear everyone without having the strain. Well, thanks for writing in, Jacob. We totally hear you on this, so to speak. And to answer your question, this was driving us crazy also, and it took us a while to figure it out. But what we realized is that many of our guests have a hard time staying close to the mic. Once they start to relax, they tend to lean back, and when they do that, the volume levels drop. So we solved this problem by getting headset mics, and that did work, but we're releasing our episodes out of the order in which we recorded them, so some of those older interviews are still being released now. What we're going to do to solve that problem going forward is to engineer our way through the audio levels, so look forward to more consistency. And thanks again for writing in, Jacob. I really do appreciate it. Now, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email us or to post your questions or comments on our Facebook page. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash together show. And we really love to hear from listeners. So don't be shy about it. Now on to the interview. Today's show is part one of a two part interview with a couple who happened to be my two favorite all time artists. This is Joshua Hagler and Maya Rusnick. I'm a huge fan of these two professionally, and they're also friends, but it was a real privilege for me to be able to look inside their personal lives in this intimate way. And this is a very long interview, so I've clipped out several sections that we'll be releasing as bonus clips for Patreon subscribers. If you don't know about Patreon, you can find out about that on our website. What we left in, frankly, were the segments about their challenges. Now, these two are a very successful and a very happy couple, but they do have one consistent challenge and that's money. Now, it'll come as no surprise to you that being a successful artist doesn't always mean financial security. And that fact has a serious impact on artists all over the world and on their personal lives. And these two have been courageous enough to drop the veil for a time and to be honest with us about how money impacts their lives and their careers. And as you'll learn in this interview, being honest about this does carry quite a risk for them. So it's really something that they were willing to do it. Thank you both for being able to be that honest. So with that, let's go to part one of our interview with Maya and Josh. Well, I would, I would say that Josh is the first person that I was with where I felt um, like I could tell he was much more emotionally mature than I was in many ways. I mean, he's older than me a little bit. But also, I think I was never with someone before who was married or who was in such a long-term relationship. Like, everyone I dated was very similar to me, where they had someone for a year, then they broke up, two years broke up. So I always felt like I was around my peers. And when I met Josh, there was, like, the sense of seriousness. Um, like, I could tell experience, you know. Um, um, I mean, in the beginning, we actually had some arguments where you were like, I'm leaving, you know. 
<laughs> when I would, because we had a lot of jealousy things in the beginning. <laughs> it's gotten better, but um, and I was like, holy shit, this guy actually has like uh, self respect. I better, <laughs> like, <laughs> I can't be throwing my temper tantrums. And I didn't even know I was doing it. By, like, by leaving, you meant that I was gonna leave the room or that leave house the room. Or yeah, whatever, not the not, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. But like, he was very emotionally healthy. Like when things got heated, he was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go home now. And one time you actually got in your car and you were driving off. He lived in Oakland at the time. And I was like, oh my God, don't, don't go home. So I called them. You know, I'm like, I'm really sorry, which was new for me. I, I didn't apologize before in my other relationships. Like even when I knew it was my fault, like the ego liked to stay fluffy and large. And something about being with Josh. And I think I really, I remember not too long ago, I was hiking over here at Griffith Park and I really like love him so much and at the end of the day I want to be with him and I think once you decide that it changes how you resolve a fight. Oh yes. Yes. Because you're more. like, well, I I don't I want to stay with him so if I keep like trying to prove something, it's not going to give me the end result that I want, which is to stay close. So then like how you go about arguing is more productive and more soft and kind and you want to listen, even if it's really hard. You're like, ah, oh, I want to, I want to, I want to really understand what's going on. Well, okay, so then this is interesting. What is the point of a fight? Well, um, you know, to be honest, a lot of our arguments lately have just been like financial pressures that have created a sense of stress that I really know for a fact would not be happening if we were more financially comfortable. So sometimes it's about the car. You know, like we share one car, which is Josh's car, and I take it to work. He takes it to work. Lately, he's been having a show, and he needs to go install and all that. So, you know, just when you have to micromanage every hour in the day, like where's the drop-off going to be? Who's going to hand off the U-Haul keys? Like it really starts, um, you realize we're agitated because, you know, if we had two cars, we would not even be having these conversations, let alone fights. So, um, and then, so I would say that's the major one. And then when we first started dating, a lot of them were like jealousy. I had a lot of jealousy issues, like, and I think it has to do with my own past relationships and my own traumatic past, you know, which I've kind of, you were, if I, are we talking jealousy about, if you talk to a woman a little oh. too long at a party, I thought he was flirting. Whereas I, I, it's just gotten so much better. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. That it's just like, <laughs> it, it's funny now. So it's, it's I mean, now lot. we check women out together. I'm like, oh, she's cute. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, she's cute. Like we were driving today and fantasizing about making out with Scarlett Johansson together. Did you guys ever <laughs> think about doing an open thing? No way. <laughs> no, I, it was always known from the beginning that that wasn't going to be something that we would do. Not at all that I'm suggest. I mean, I want to stay with Josh forever, like if that's possible, and I hope it, w you know. But if if it was getting to the point where I found myself constantly excited and attracted, you know, like where I was like no longer able to focus, I would take that as a sign. Yeah. Like something is not hap. It's almost like vitamins in a relationship. I feel like you're kind of feeding each other vitamins, and if you start feeling anemic. You're looking for vitamins in other places. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would take that as a, as a cue to examine what you have and maybe, like, I guess, and that's the thing. I remember listening to the old talk uh, interview you did with me where I'm not interested in editing in my artwork. Mm -hmm. I'm also not interested in editing a relationship too much. Hmm. Like, and, uh, and I feel like at the point where you feel like you're editing or you have this impulse to fix it, I would rather leave. Because well, <laughs> I mean, that's interesting. So wait, if that's true, then you're saying it has to be perfect all the time. No, no. Okay. I, I think it's like, um, like w there's a lot of discomfort as, as well as a lot of like good times with what we have, but I don't feel like it's editing. It doesn't feel, it's more like learning how to live with someone's way of being. It's not like I'm trying to change Josh's character. If this that makes is, any sense. Oh, this is a fascinating distinction. You you have to pull it out more. Um, okay, very simple example. Okay, you know how I was making the comments about Josh leaving jackets and socks everywhere? Yes. That's something he's going to do forever if we stay forever. 
it's something I can live with. Yeah. Right? Um, if he was doing something like, um, oh gosh, maybe you can help me out. Like something that would be more like a very disturbing aspect of his character that really I felt was uh, making me feel bad about myself. Like if we went out and he never introduced me to people or I don't know. I'm, I mean, I think you just, I think the kinds of things that I would do that would make you, when you're saying you don't want to edit, right. is like if I were like perpetually d showing a certain lack of respect or even love or right. whatever it might be and you could see that in either the way that I was uh, treating other people or treating you in front of other people or this kind of thing. Then you, right. you wouldn't try to fix that. You would leave. Yeah, I would feel like my 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 confidence is being crippled, and like my self worth would be. And then I I wouldn't want to make him a better person. I would just depart. So it's almost as if fundamental qualities, in your view, are either there or they're not there. And if the fundamental characteristics of a person that you're in love with are present, then you can deal with the non-fundamental elements. I would say so. Yeah, I kind of like think of them as like pillars of a personality. It's like your hardwired parts. So do you think that just do, do those things never change? No, I guess I don't. Um, I think it's also knowing how much um, emotional energy you're capable of giving. So if I, like, I have a lot of anxiety, I would go ahead and say I suffer from it, you know, and I have my own financial stresses and my, so I know that, but I also know that I have a really great capacity to love and I have a lot of empathy. So I would, I would say that it's at the point where I would choose to depart. It's not that I, I'm saying this person is never going to change, but it's more knowing what I have within myself to deal with what they're giving me. It's either adequate or not. So it's more like a understanding myself and like self-preservation thing. Yes. Wow. Okay. So that then raises the question for me of commitment, lifetime commitment, marriage, all of these things and where they come together. Because you said you'd like to stay with Josh forever if that's possible. And, and then there's a thing called marriage where a lot of people make a commitment. Now, not all marriages include this commitment, but many marriages include the commitment of staying lifetime. And some of them mean, like, no matter what, even if you turn out to be an axe murderer, we're married forever. Some people believe that. And some people have a different level of when they would leave. Where do you fall on that scale of... Uh, uh, well, first, let me ask, have you, are you planning to make a, com a commitment? I mean, I, the way that I feel about Josh right now, I, w I would love to get married. And, but I think, if anything, there's more hesitation from him because he's already done that. Yeah. And I'm, like, I, I don't feel like, well, it needs to happen or I'm out. Right. But it is something that if he wasn't hesitant, I would say, let's do it tomorrow. Yeah. Because I, I do feel... But I also, if I get married and I find out that he is, like, a pedophile or something, I don't feel like I need to stay with him. Yeah. I would get a divorce. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, and there's then, something I've been meaning to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and then, okay, so, and then if you did get married... What would be what would be the promise? So not if he, if he's a pedophile, you're out. Um, <laughs> oh my god! What? I feel like I'm talking too much. Feel free to jump in. No, 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 I, no I I'm don't still wanna, asking I, you. I don't oh, want okay, okay, okay. to interrupt. <clears throat> okay, okay. Could you characterize what the promise would be? If I got married, what I would expect from from him? Hmm. Well, okay, maybe this is something um, like where I feel like a lot of my own like I've been having a hard time lately financially and I think maybe if we got married it would not feel I would not feel so alone and this is a great example um like I have not been and I, I'm totally okay being this open and about people knowing my all my business but um compared to last year I've been like struggling a lot more in terms of I had to get a part-time job. And even with that job, it's still like I barely make enough to make ends meet. I've been selling as much art. So, um, I like, sometimes, I'll interrupt here for one second just to say that often I think when you describe the situation, you really understate it. I okay, think that well, anybody that was in your situation that you're in right now would be going mad. Like every month it's like, 
up until the first, I'm figuring out how I will have enough to pay rent. Um, and if you ever feel like I'm talking too much about your own situation, please, you know, just... I've already agreed to this whole thing. Yeah. We can so we're, we're not <laughs> we in the same... Yeah. We're not in the same situation there. So this turmoil I feel about, like, literally, I will sometimes look at my Wells Fargo and to see if I have enough to buy a sandwich. Like, that's not Josh's reality. Like, it's... I'm not saying he's wealthy, but, you know, it's... So I think if we were to get married, I wouldn't feel like I need to check to see if I have $3 or 20 to buy a sandwich. I would feel that I think more, more like if he sold a painting, you know, a lot of our jealousies in the beginning were like uh, career ones. We're still like if Those one are the of, jealousies we still have. We still have. And I think because I still don't feel if Josh, I mean, I do in a sense where we're like emotionally sharing things, but like... If we were married, I think if he sold a piece for $30,000, I would in some way feel like it, it's like I can get a new pair of shoes maybe if I need new shoes. I don't feel that way anymore. Like, hey, Josh, can you get me a pair of shoes? I could really use some new, new ones. Yeah. Oh, man, you think I wouldn't buy you new shoes well, if I sold a $30,000 painting? Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm using all these, like I'm kind of blowing things out of proportion. Oh, okay. You know, okay. like maybe a 10000 but like I haven't asked you thus far. Like yeah. to buy me clothes or to buy me shaving gel for my legs, <laughs> you know, just because like, because I will sometimes ask you like, oh, like even this upcoming month, I'll ask you to spot me five days for rent until I get paid on the fifth. But like, that's as much as I'll ask for help because I feel like we're still like two individuals, even though we have a home together and we pay rent, I still feel like a sense of aloneness when things are really hard. And I would just hope, maybe I'm delusional, maybe people who are married, they're like, oh, honey, it ain't like that. But I would hope that if I get married, I wouldn't feel that sense of, of being alone. And is it only financial? I would say right now, that's the main thing. I feel like emotionally, we're really, um, we're so connected. Like when one of us is uncomfortable in a social situation, the other one knows and will like touch each other. Like I feel in all other ways, we're really connected. Not that we're not connected financially, but like I, f I would say that's like where the, the tangible divide sometimes is felt. Now, and I'm not suggesting this, but just to understand it uh, conceptually, what if Josh suggested that you merge finances pre-marriage? Would you have a problem with doing that because of your view of marriage and non-marriage and whatnot? I think I would feel... I would feel not as good if uh, I think saying you're marrying someone, it's like you're making a commitment and it's a ritual. And I like the idea that it's a, it's a ritual where other people are witnessed and you're kind of telling people you're doing, you're, you're, you're having a union, you know, I think if we arranged for us to join our finance, like I would actually feel guilty about that because I would know, I would feel that I'm the only one benefiting from it. As of right now, maybe like in a month things will change and I'll start selling. But um, I would feel less bad if we were married because it feels like another level of saying, I'm here for you. Yeah. And it, well, it's interesting how you said that he wouldn't be getting as much out of it. But you have an idea that if you were married, he would be somehow getting something out of it. Is that right or did I just make that up? Well, I guess it sounds that way if you kind of unpack what I said, although it doesn't, I don't like the way it sounds. Well, another way to say it is that the, the, there's something intrinsic about marriage that makes that stratification okay. Right. It, it's almost like I would have less guilt knowing that he were merging things because it's like, it's almost like a stamp of approval with a marriage. He's like, I'll take you even though I know that I'm financially much more stable. Right. Like, because it, we're like, a unit. We're a unit. And it's like in actual document form and it's, it's tangible. And, and our you, unity includes these elements. And right. that's just what our unit is. Right. Versus now, you're just separate elements. Um, like even today when we had breakfast, you know, you were like, I, I know that you feel alone when, cause you've been in that position before, you know, not too long ago you were, and that's also really nice because it's not like what I'm expressing. Josh is like, I have no idea what you're going through cause he's been there. You know, we're both aware that it might flip flop and yo-yo. Maybe there'll be a time when I'm doing better than he is. And in a, in a weird way, not that I want him to not continue doing as well, but I would want to do well so I could actually somehow 
create some sense of balance because I feel like since we've been together, he's always helped me, except for the first week. <laughs> but that was... <laughs> the first week. <laughs> we started dating and started immediately borrowing 200 bucks from each other and paying it back within a week. We were both so uh, financially... Iffy. And I remember my friend saying, actually, she was like, that's not good. You shouldn't let him know about how you are, really are financially. And I was like, well, it would be worse if he, if he found out a, a month later. I couldn't disagree with your friend more. Yeah, I'm like, that's <laughs> manipulative, you know? Like, just let him know what he's in for right away. <laughs> let it all out. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, so, <clears throat> Josh, turning to you, I'm really curious. You must know all of these things. How does it impact you hearing it stated in this all at once in this format. I had so many reactions while she was saying all of that and uh, I didn't want to interrupt and I, there's so many different directions and tangents I could take that it would fill up your whole podcast. Well, I let's think. do it. Let's <laughs> take that. I mean, that's just it. Uh, well, I think maybe the first thing I want to say most importantly is like, um, I really, like I, I really feel do feel that I deeply understand her feelings of insecurity around finances feelings of just raw panic all of that stuff because I've had all the same experiences and although I haven't been in a situation recently in like the past two years or so where I've really had to panic like that uh, most of my adult life I've just been panicking financially and I also know that my situation currently is only stable relative to her situation, but right. relative to most people's situation. Right. Like uh, my age, like a, a 36 year old educated man who would be, mm -hmm. who would have like a professional job or what is, you know, right. far more secure than I am. And it's just, um, hmm. and, and, and with, you know, the art world, it's like, uh, you never know when things are going to stop selling or, you know, it's not even like they sell that much really currently. It's just that, for whatever reason, when things start to get a little low, it seems like something kind of gets in there again and before I have to start panicking. And um, it makes me really sad to hear, you know, that uh, you feel like really alone with that struggle because I felt very alone with that struggle too. Um, Even and, though you were married. Hmm. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and I, that was another kind of, thought that I had while you were talking about marriage mm -hmm. but and going back to that like when you're talking about like feelings of guilt and that stuff like mm -hmm. I felt all that stuff when I was married felt guilty all the time but it's like there was like part of me that was like you know like, like she never really has had you know the ex has never had to worry about money because of her particular situation so that like there I, I sometimes would feel like I don't necessarily really need to be going through this panic but it's not like she never helped me and it's not like I never help you right. um, but still there's that like discomfort with like you still know that ultimately like the struggle is kind of yours alone mm -hmm. y you know when we were married we were very separate and that wasn't my choice I would have liked to be more um, intertwined in that way but I had I never felt like I had had any um uh, anything to kind of throw into the pile. So I felt like I wasn't, right. I didn't deserve a voice then, mm. you know, if I didn't have anything to contribute. And then of course, anytime I needed her help financially, I felt guilty about it. I think maybe, you know, maybe the, if there are little differences, there's the gender differences. I think like as a man, mm. you feel emasculated when you have to have a woman take care of you sometimes, you know? Um, and there, there was always that. So then, to, you know, to, to see what she's going through now, it, it, he, uh, I feel really involved. Like I know that in in many ways, like the deepest parts of that struggle are yours alone, and I, I don't know that there's anything I can do about that. But I really am, um, like I really am trying to be here, you know. Right. Like, I know. I know. <laughs> <you are. laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, it, it, we're both artists, you know. And I think like most people, I mean, I, we know for a fact, both of us, like just from social environment like as an artist you're kind of like you're you're fluid in uh class stratification so like mm. we typically live around and work around poor people but then a lot of times you're socializing with wealthy people and 
you know, when you're around people of different classes, it feels like they kind of just assume that you're like them, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and, the, and the, when you can tell that that assumption is being made and you're like, I, I don't know how I'm going to like pay for this bill when it comes at the restaurant, you know? Um, I don't think like, I don't think like most people know that about most artists that they're really <laughs> like freaking out like that, you know? And so there's a lot of, we're around a lot of smugness. And that it, when you're around higher classes, they don't know how smug they are. And also things happen <laughs> in an art career where people would not know how your day-to-day -day is. You know, like when I had my show in Belgium, it had like three reviews. It was reviewed by Agenda Magazine, which is one of the biggest magazines in Brussels. But like that month, I had to borrow money from Josh. Yeah. You know, and every, like people are like, oh my God, you're blowing up, your career is great. And it is, it, one aspect of it is. So we know also that, um, you know, and this also goes back into some of the things we have to deal with, like with the jealousies. We both know that like, if you're financially stable th from your art, doesn't always mean that you're getting the reviews you wish you had, but the critical sort of, you know. So there's like, there is no... Um, so, you know, on that level, I feel pretty good. I feel like when people look saw my work in Belgium, it was really understood. It was really talked about the way I, I wanted to. I had the best conversations with people who came over to the sh you know? But then I came back really emotionally and spiritually full, but then empty. In your stomach. In my stomach, <laughs> you know? I, so, and and um, this is kind of where I was going yeah. with some of that. It's just like trying to like lay down like the the foundation of like how artists even artists that you think are successful and stuff like how they really mm -hmm. live is um because uh so much of like the, you know the the anxiety and stuff that you're describing although you may have some anxiety stemming from earlier on oh, in right, life right, right, right. like uh it's really just financial like once i made sixty thousand dollars one year like guess what i was happier i was not nearly as neurotic or mm -hmm. anxious or whatever and that's not that much money but like you, you know, felt to, the difference. Yeah, I mean, like, if you were bringing in more money right. right now, like, a lot of the, like, sort of, like, pressure and panic and everything that, like, leads to some of these mm -hmm. explosive moments, like, they just wouldn't be occurring. Right, and, and, and I, just, I, like, I know like that. A, there's just, like, a certain, like, um, you know, a quality of life that is just so hard for so many people to attain to even get to the point where they can have like comfortable armchair discussions about their relationships. But you know, this is the other aspect of it and not to romanticize poverty at all because, you know, having been born in Bosnia and being a refugee and all that, like there's nothing romantic. I, 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 but like, I think having like being an educated person, you know, I did my undergrad at Berkeley, studied psychology, went to CCA and having access to this like higher, you know, like intellectual crowd, but then also relating to immigrants that I see on the street and on the metro, like a woman trying to get across the street with one baby in her in her arm and the other one, you know, the girl we saw, like when I see that, like, oh my God, like I always get teary eyed because I, 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 can, I can identify with her body, like, and how uncomfortable it is and why she's doing what she is. And I'm actually grateful for that. I feel really close to people who we, when we're on our, in our car going to some fancy opening, mm -hmm. would just be like, oh, like, that's my mission. But like, I think having, having to be uncomfortable, it does make you look at things a little bit closer. And my work is about that in many ways. So it's not like, um, luckily I have a place for it, for all the discomfort, you know? The art. The art. So, um, I, otherwise, I don't know what I would do with wow. it. <laughs> you know, and that, forgive me for this cliche, but I have to ask now, if, if, if you had financial stability, would the art come out as poignant and rich? You know, yes. yeah, and I, I like to, I mean, I definitely don't romanticize, you know, that artist who's like, I need to feel pain, I need yeah. to, like, think about all the times I was abused to feel the feelings, like, I don't believe in that at all. Like, I know for myself that when I have a nice cup of coffee and a good quinoa salad and I go to my studio and I'm calm and after I ran, like, the work is better because I can feel, I can be more present and being more present makes the work better. But when you're constantly anxious, That's it, exactly, yeah. like that doesn't make the work better, I don't think. What a what a, what a fascinating 
moment it must be to have a, a painting on the wall of a gallery selling for $60,000 and be at your opening with extraordinarily financially secure people all around you and at the same time be wondering if you're going to be able to pay your phone bill that month. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's... Uh... <laughs> it's and they like, have no they have no, and they idea. Have no idea. Yeah. And 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 do you, are you wanting to tell them? If you do, it, it's it like ruins it everything. Backfires. It's because everybody wants to bet on a winner. So then, if you look desperate, mm-hmm. it looks like oh well, they shouldn't be buying that then, not for the price that it's being asked. Ah, oh, what a horrible! Because because we all know that peace comes from truth and authenticity and not hiding. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, if you fully articulate the truth, you're setting up failure for yourself in a way. I think maybe it's not uh, well, just one or the other. I think um, I like the romantic idea, you know, of what you were saying before that have, you know, further you want peace, you know, you have to go further toward the truth. Um, I think if. Uh, if you do that all at once, uh, I, don't, I don't know what you're going to find. Maybe maybe happiness in some other area, not art or something that's, you know, involves something like where there's so much uh, pedigree and class things happening. But I think that if when you get little bits of success, um, you can kind of let a little bit more show. And, I and mm. it, you know, now I really feel to the point, because it's, it's been over 10 years or something now, you know? What? That, 10 years what? Uh, since I've been making art with the majority of my time, that more or less a full-time artist. Um, and uh, I'm at the point now in my life where uh, I have a lot less fear than I did then, which actually does have a benefit to the work, you realize like all these things that people sort of like try to like warn you about or threaten you with, like they're not really big threats. Like a gallery throws you out, it doesn't fucking matter. Like there's somebody else to take their place and quite honestly, you can probably do as well yourself as they could have done for you, what you're talking about, 90% of the galleries, you know? So you can kind of say, fuck them. Like if you don't like something that they say or do and it seems to be impinging your work, fuck them, leave. It doesn't matter. You don't have to give it more than 30 seconds thought. You know how liberating that is? And all I've done is better since I've been able to have that fearlessness. Yes. And uh, Mm. I think um, most artists live in that kind of fear. But if they had no fear like whatsoever earlier on, then they wouldn't even be able to have some of the conversations that get them to the point that they can kind of jump off the diving board at a certain point. Right. You know? Well, and as you're saying it, the, the realization I'm having is that it's not necessarily about spewing the truth. It's about acknowledging and allowing the truth to be whatever the hell it is. But you know, I even think that is like a two-way street. I have a collector who's more of a patron in San Francisco, and I always tell Josh, I'm like, if I ever like really make it at the level where I want, like I'm like going to dedicate most of my success to to him, because the way he is, he makes me feel like it's okay to tell him the truth. You know, and it's a uh, well, anybody with. I I, I, I want to say anybody with some self-awareness is going to want you to do so. Yeah. And I think it's even in like just questions. He was like, hey, how how are you doing? And I know what he means by that. Like, you okay? You know, and uh, I feel comfortable enough to, with him to say, you know, it's a little hard, you know. Um, but I also don't ever want to do like pity purchases, you know, where and it doesn't feel that way. And so it's like you do have to be delicate about... Um, almost like preserving your own sense of dignity while poor. <laughs> yeah. Well, back to your relationship. Uh, so was there anything else that you <laughs> felt when she was talking about the challenges she's facing that you, that you didn't get to say? Well, I, I think I was going to say that, um, like, uh, as far as, like, the, com- the combining of resources go, you know, of uh, finances... Um, like it's, uh, scary. It's, you know, like at the, when we moved here, like my overhead per month now is higher than it's ever been. And I took kind of a calculated risk to do that. And I never really feel secure and of myself and of myself, you know? And, um, 
uh, I guess I, I feel like uh, I don't, like I feel horrible thinking that she feels alone because I, I do feel like I'm helping, but I wonder if I'm not helping enough for one thing. But, um, but I think like if you were, if you were married, you know, you would have like a mutual savings account and like, you know, probably someone to have a 401k or something like that. But I don't really even get a chance to save either. So, um, uh, I don't know that like, like if we got married tomorrow, whether that would change significantly. I actually and, don't and, think either. And I think that if, um, that we both suddenly had all this financial stability, there would also then be no right. real emergency or motivation to suddenly get married. So do, me- you, do, you, do you feel pressure to get married based on what she said? No. Do you feel pressure to help her out more based on what she said? Um, not pressure. Like, I mean, I want to be helping more than I am. Yeah. You know, so I, it just, it just reconfirms that is all. Well, well, there was like, there, there was another thing she said about marriage though, which was not so much that we would have more money as that we would be a unit. Mm-hmm. And in, and in the unity of that, she would feel less alone, even if there were less money, arguably. Yeah. I don't, uh, I just, I don't think that would happen. Uh, and, uh, because you felt alone even though you were in your marriage. I, I, I think people are still alone. I don't, mean, I don't even mean to talk about my personal experiences. I, I do, and maybe this is a little dark, but I do think that there's a part of us that are kind of basically always alone. You know? and, and, and I don't really uh, feel bad about that. I, uh, sometimes maybe it's a good thing. Even if it's not a good thing, um, I just think that it's true. And... Uh, I think there are things that, um, you know, that, that might emerge in her, her art or when she's writing or something like that that would surprise me. I have a feeling there are things in there that I don't know about that would surprise me. And some things maybe even you don't know about that would surprise you too. And I think uh, that's, you know, that's the part of you that's alone. And that's the, you know. The but part that's of the part that I think it's a beautiful kind of alone. Like I have two different kinds of alone. Like when I'm alone, stuck with a painting and suffering because I'm stuck in my studio, beautiful kind of alone. You're writing a poem, you don't know what the next line is, beautiful kind of alone. You're going up on a hike, you don't know if you can make it up to the end of the hill, beautiful kind of alone. Those are fine. Those are like existential. They're like the tip of Maslow's hierarchy of needs kinds of alones, you know, and then there's a kind of alone. I don't think existential alones are ever fine. I just think that, (laughs) well, they're, they're, to me, they're a decadent kind of alone, which is very different than being alone when you really check your account and you're like, I cannot eat lunch today, which has happened to me in the last month. And that is not a kind of alone that I think I would have if I was married, or maybe I should reiterate. I think there are people who are married and this is where I am like having kind of an ism towards cultures. I think I see a lot of Americans who are married. I would never know they're married. They have separate bank accounts. They have all that. Like I have a more Bosnian, uh, European maybe even like idea of what a marriage is. And I just feel that the kind of marriage I would want to be in, I would feel that we're not that separated, you know? Um, like I have a few friends who are married and they, they don't have merged bank accounts. That's weird to me personally. I think it's weird too. So I, I don't know. Like, uh, I, I just know for a fact that I wouldn't feel that kind of aloneness if I had to buy food at least. And that's, that's kind of a big deal. And any time where I've ever known that you were that close to broke where you wouldn't be able to eat or something like that. But then when I, when I'm with you, it's nice. Yeah. But then there are times when we're not together in the day on on, on the days and I don't work. Have money to eat. And I don't have time, you know? I didn't know that. I told you that. <laughs> the, we don't please edit this out, but like <laughs> how do you not know He's that? Not I said that the other day. Like this is so funny. Uh, this is another thing that's did, a little did, did did she say that, Josh? I I don't I don't remember. I'm I'm confused. It's okay. This is another problem in our relationship. I'll say things and then it's not remembered and then it's like who's 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 right, who's wrong. You know. But this is another thing like um th- that I find it hard and where I feel like a burden 
if, for example, today I'm like, Josh, can you get me a sandwich? And then if I go to work tomorrow, I don't expect him to give me 10 bucks so I can get food. But I wake up that morning, the next morning, and go to work. And that would be a day when I don't have enough money to eat. So I don't expect you to know while you're in bed sleeping that I'm leaving, getting in the car that needs gas, that I don't have money, you know? But like that is when I feel alone. And I just don't think that would happen. I maybe wouldn't even feel that guilty if it was my husband. I'd be like, yo, give me 20 bucks. I just don't feel that comfortable to do that, even though I feel comfortable in every other way. And I don't know why. Maybe I'm delusional that I think that a, a, a ritual of a marriage would make me feel less guilty about it, but I really think it would. But then when you say, I don't think things change, I think your marriage with, with Laura was one that I think would be very different than if you and I were married, just from what I know about her as a, as a person. I mean, it would be different, yeah. So I, I think that kind of distance you guys had, I don't think we would have just because of our natures. Mm-hmm. Anyways, it got spicy in here. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, is this spicy comfortable for you guys? I'm not comfortable. What are you feeling? Um, worried. I, I don't know. I just uh, sometimes like, you know, like in the present situation, I just uh, uh, inwardly, I, uh, I guess I feel like I'm a lot more conscious of what you're going through and I'm a lot more helpful toward you then it seems like you feel that I am I didn't know no I'm sorry and if I, if I came across that way, it was more just like we're talking about the feeling al- alone mm-hmm. and I was just like talking about that and, and like how uh, <sighs> often I don't have enough money unless I make food here to get lunch and I have expressed that and I feel almost like weird saying that right now because it's like it seems like I'm saying it for the first time but um it's very real and I'm not trying to make anyone look bad or make myself, but it's, it's a very real part of my life and it, it is why I'm so anxious lately. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's all it is. Yeah. Uh, I'm really grateful for, for when we, we were together today and you got me lunch and that was really nice. I was also really fortunate that we were together mm-hmm. and you got me lunch yesterday too. And that was really nice. Can I unpack something? Yes. So there's several layers of fear here that I'm present to. On your side, Maya, there's the critical fear around money. Mm-hmm. Like that's root, that rooted survival fear right. that you're feeling, and you're feeling it a lot lately. Fairly constantly. Yeah. And then above that, there's the fear of taking care of the relationship between you and Josh hmm. and the impact that sharing this critical fear with Josh might have on the relationship. Mm. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. And then Josh, you've got two or three fears that I can see also. You've got the critical fear about being able to make it, um, even though it's a little bit less sharp right now because it's been a little little easier the last couple of years, though definitely not easy. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the fear... And I might be making this one up, but I think you might have a fear above that of your goodness as a person because what she's saying mm-hmm. feels like it might implicate your your morality or like mm-hmm. something about you that's important in terms of did you hear her or not hear her? Are you sensitive to these things? Are you generous? That stuff. Mm-hmm. And then you've also got that third fear of the relationship. Like is this conversation threatening to the relationship. Mm-hmm. Uh, did I miss any? No, nope, that's good. Very amazing. You're like a therapist. <laughs> 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 well, that's where we're pausing the interview today, folks. Thanks for listening. On Thursday, we'll pick it back up and Maya and Josh will go a bit deeper into this conversation, both unpacking some of the root causes of these fears and also taking the first steps towards working through the issues together. And it's really wonderful to see them take that process on. So definitely tune in for that episode. And we'd love to know what you think of Maya and Josh's challenges. If you have a question or if you'd like to share about this interview in any way, please go to our Facebook page and post a comment on the post about this show. You can find that at facebook.com slash together show. We would really love to hear from you. So don't be shy. 
Now, you can find out more about Josh and Maya at their websites, which I will also be posting in the show notes in case you can't hear it now. Now, Josh's website is joshuahagler.com. That's J-O-S-H-U-A-H-A-G-L-E-R.com. And Maya's website is on the edge of reason.com. I'm not going to spell that out because I think you probably know how to spell those words. Now, if you like what you heard on the show today, please subscribe to us on iTunes. It makes a huge difference when you do that. If you have any questions or comments, or if you'd like to be on the show, please reach out to us via one of our platforms. You can find our website at together.guide. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash together show. Our Twitter and Instagram profiles are both at together underscore show, or you can email me at host at together.guide. Our producer is Charlene Goto. Our web designer is Courtney Munna. Our art director and my one and only is Aubrey Pick. She's making dinner right now. In fact, it's probably already done. I need to get in there. Thanks once again to my guests, Josh and Maya. I love you guys. I can't wait to see you soon. That's all for today, folks. See you next time.